Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This is our third non-denominational holiday season podcast. TISF will return again on 15th February 2011. And while the book review section is on hiatus this month, we do have two Christmassy stories to entertain you through the holidays. I say Christmassy because Jason Fisher's story, Undead Camels Ate Their Flesh, has camels in it, albeit zombie camels. And Lee Battersby's story, In From the Snow, contains large amounts of that festively frosty ground cover. Admittedly, it's splattered liberally with blood, but that's a minor quibble. So have a great holiday Sit back and enjoy Lee Battersby's In From The Snow. It's snowing outside the house. Snow is dangerous. You leave tracks, and tracks can be used to follow you. I am to stay inside. Father will not permit me outside, not until I am fully trained. The Darrington boy went out last winter and brought the weight of the gallows down upon his whole family. There are few families left. Snow is too great a risk. Last snow, the family acquired a cookbook. We've had a year to practice pickling, preserving, bottling. We are not so reliant upon fresh food as we once were. It takes time to build up reserves, and we've always been cautious gatherers. Travellers are rare this season. Snow makes things difficult for everybody. Still, father is out amidst the white world. Travellers are rare, but our need is great. Our need is always great, and Mother is pregnant again. I have been left to guard the house. I am the eldest male, and in the last two years I have grown large and strong. Large enough, and strong enough to defend Mother and the children. Even Father eyes me warily. All I need is experience. In the meantime, I sit in the front room and watch snow forming patterns through the windows. I pick out flakes and stalk them as they skitter across my field of vision. They make for good tracking practice, jumping and diving like rabbits across a field. I'm so caught up in my pursuit that I'm taken by surprise when a shape looms out of the darkness, grey against black. Snow dies against its borders. I leap back from the window. Mother! Get the children! I race for the door at the side of the house. Only a fool rushes toward the enemy. Into the kitchen! The kitchen is a stone vault at the centre of the building. Everyone in the family knows how to use a knife, a pot, a kettle of boiling water. Within its confines, even babies become attackers. As I hit the door, I hear Mother shouting at the children. I cast them from my thoughts, push through the door and into the cold. The door swings shut behind me, locking into place. No entrance into the house can be opened from the outside. Either I will signal my return with the correct knock, or I will not return at all. No member of this family gives themselves up, not even our dwelling. I hit the ground and roll away at an angle, diving across a snowbank and behind the oak where it looms across the entrance. As I rise, I slip the hunting knife from the sheath at my thigh. No cause to use my throwing knives. Miss, and they are lost until the thaw, and we cannot afford to lose precious edged weapons. The swirling snow gives me cover. I will get close enough to strike. I may not be experienced, but I do know my trade. To move quickly without being seen is at the heart of everything we do. It takes me less than a minute to gain the front of the house. The figure stands ten feet from the door, swaying as the wind buffets it. He's smaller than I first thought, and lighter in frame. He topples and falls headlong into the snow. I crouch, knife hand tucked into the angle of my hip and thigh. I've used this ruse to capture prey before. Fall as if weakened, then spring upon the unwary Samaritan who comes to help. The ground is too cold to hold the ruse for long. Sooner or later, a movement will betray the supine figure. Breath stings my nostrils. I tilt my head, directing the streams of warm air towards my chest. No puff of moisture shall reveal my location. The figure on the ground does not move. Unless he moves now, the intruder will freeze to death. 
I wait a minute more, then sneak around the far side of the mound of whiteness building up over his body. So long without movement, there is no risk that he will be able to overcome me. Even so, I will not hurry my attack. I approach until I am no more than two feet away, close enough to strike, but out of reach of a sudden lunge from the ground. The coating of snow doesn't move. I tense my thigh muscles, crouch, and launch myself. The prey does not react. My knees strike the middle of his back. My knife sweeps down and stops an inch from where the throat lies beneath the snow. Something is wrong. This is no attacker. An attacker would have moved. I lean back, use my empty hand to expose the body. It lies face down, unmoving, barely breathing. This is no man set on usurping my home, my family. She's a woman, pale face against paler snow, dark hair shaken loose from the hood of her cloak by the fall. Her lips are turning blue. She's the first woman I've ever seen outside the family group. I waste seconds staring at the unfamiliar lines of her face, the exotic cast of her cheeks, her closed eyes, her neck. I scoop her up with a single movement, run to the door and bang out today's knock against the wood. I wait, stamping my feet until the entrance inches open, then barge past mother and into the kitchen. Blankets, I order, and boil the kettle. Mother favours me with a black expression, and I growl at her. Move! She scurries to obey. I use the woman's body to clear the table of obstructions, then lay her down. Some of the smaller children press close to look. I snarl at them until they back away. Mother returns, her arms full of bedding. I tear blankets from her grasp and throw them across the limp body. The kettle arrives and I pour water over a towel, fold it in quarters and wipe her face and limbs. She groans and twists from the contact. I persist and her protestations grow more insistent. In less than a minute she sits up and stares at her surroundings. The children, brave attackers all, squeak and dart behind nearby hiding places, including mother's legs. I would punish them, but I can't take my eyes from the woman. She sees me watching her and opens her mouth to scream. I shoot a hand forward and clamp it over her mouth. Don't. She stares at me with wide eyes. I look away for a moment, determined not to notice how blue they are. Mother titches. The woman's nostrils flare as she drags in air. I push harder, mashing her lips back against her teeth, and she winces. With my hand not over her mouth, her scream would now be from pain. I lean close so that my eyes fill her vision. Don't scream, I hiss. They'll kill you. Now that the children have grown used to the strange visitor, they've returned from their hiding. Ragged hair and smiling, they would frighten anybody. The woman inhales once, twice. I give her head a short shake, just enough to bring her attention back to me. When I let you go, you sit still. Otherwise. I nod towards the children, then slowly remove my hand from her mouth. She watches me, fear brightening her eyes. Only when my hand is back against my chest does she relax, though her eyes dart here and there. I straighten, allowing her a small measure of room. Mother nods in the corner of my vision, a small sign of respect. Good, I say, and fold my arms. What's your name? I get no response. Either she's too frightened or I've been warning a mute. Mother speaks. She's shivering. Yeah. I point to little Bellis. Some wine. She runs to do my bidding. I'm fond of Bellis. She's obedient and sharp. Within a minute she returns and hands a mug to the woman. Drink. She does so, eyes fixed upon me over the edge of the mug. She chokes after the second swallow. A gout of wine spills over her shirt. I watch it trickle across her chest. Mother hisses. I shake my head. Your name? Morel, she says, averting her eyes. I study the incline of her face, the softness of her skin. She's younger than I'd first thought, perhaps no more than 16 or 17, my own age. The skin of my throat begins to itch. I take back the mug and hand it to Bellis. Morel uses her sleeve to dab at the corners of her mouth. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I perch on the table next to her. What were you doing out during the snow? This is no place for a solitary traveller. You're not from a family. Family? What do you mean? Mother and I exchange glances. Some of the younger children gasp. Mother silences them with a stare. Such looseness will be punished later. I keep emotion from my face. You're alone? She pauses before answering, and I become aware of how heavily we're all leaning towards her answer. 
I click my fingers and the children disperse. Within seconds, the sound of fake play reaches us from the surrounding rooms. I'm not fooled. There are ways to listen without seeming to do so, and our children are well trained. Morel seems not to notice the falseness. She relaxes, and her voice gains some strength. My caravan. We were travelling south, to Aelvik. My father and mother, myself and three retainers, a man. He jumped out of the snow. She stops, looking past me at events too fresh to be ignored. He killed mother with his teeth. Father! Mother and I glance at each other over the top of her head. Father hunts wild, on occasion, when the odds are in his favour or he forgets himself. What happened? He killed them. Everyone. Even after Vine shot him, he just kept going. There was so much blood. So much. She raises her hands to cover her eyes. I just ran. Ran out into the storm just to get away. Had to get away. Mother. Tears overcome her and she bends into herself, voice swept away by the fear and the grief. I place an arm around her shoulder and make comforting noises. Mother signals Anna. A warm bed for her and a shot of the sleeping broth. Set one of the little ones to watch. Get me when she wakes. Anna half carries the weeping Morel away. The sound of her crying disappears up the stairs before Mother speaks. Shot. I nod, eyes fixed upon the door. A caravan of six. You know what we have to do? I nod again and stand. I don't want her harmed. What? Mother turns her head, sharp as a bird. And what do we? If father is dead, I step over to her and realise just how much bigger than her I've become, how much taller. I can look over her without lowering my chin, and she shrinks the tiniest fraction of my closeness. If he is dead, then I am. If, she says, voice hard with a challenge. If not, I shrug. If not, he'll return. I turn from her and make my way to my room. I am the oldest child. I have the greatest share of responsibilities. My room is the largest in the house, besides the kitchen and mother and father's bedroom. What little I own fits comfortably within. My weapons and pack, what few clothes I don't already wear. A small wooden ball and a string, the only childhood toy that has not been passed on to a younger one. A single bed. It's enough. And yet standing in the doorway, I am struck by a flash of dissatisfaction. I see Morel with me, inside the room, and realise just how small it is, how there is nothing in here for anybody, not even me. The moment passes. I grab my cloak and knife and shrug my pack over one shoulder. I don't bother to close the door when I leave. There's nothing to take. In the kitchen I fill the pack with a skin of wine and enough meat to last. Mother catches up to me as I tuck the last strands inside. That's the last of it, she nods at the pack. I don't want her harmed. Father wouldn't hesitate. Father isn't here. I draw my cloak around me and pull it tight. We walk to the door and she pats me down, fussing. She is mother, after all. Be careful. A caravan of six. I open the door. A blast of arctic hate strikes me in the face. Whichever one of us returns, we'll get through the winter. Kester. Mother raises her hand to my face, holding it there for a moment before letting it fall. He'll be injured if he's not dead. Are you sure? It had to come. I smile, hoping it's not the final smile I give her. This is how we go on. The strongest will lead. I turn from her and step out into the storm. I do not even hear the door close. I am no more than a dozen feet from the house when the wind grabs the edges of my coat and hurls me to the ground. Father would kill me for coming out in this weather. At the least, he would give me a beating that would leave me unable to hunt for weeks. A body lost to the snow is a waste of hunting equipment, and hunting is all we have to sustain us. A family can breed, but knives are hard to come by. It takes me half an hour to reach the gate at the far end of the property, and another hour to cross the frozen river into the world. Father is too experienced to be caught in the open. Either Morel is right, and he lies dead amongst the wreckage of the caravan, or he's found shelter. If that is so, then I will die. I am under no illusions. I am young and strong, but father has led our family for many years. There is no better hunter on the cliffs. Even injured 
he would recognize my challenge and kill me. Morel claimed she was on the way to Elvik. A driver would have skirted the cliffs and headed for the inland roads. I turned to the east, straight into the teeth of the wind, and take one step, then another. This journey will be a matter of single steps. I will not count them. Simply look for the next snowbank, the next tree, anything I can hide behind to catch my breath and wipe the frozen snot from my lips. It's more than three hours before I reach the nearest pack road, a distance I would run in less than half an hour at the beginning of a normal hunt. A family does not stalk this road. Too close to home. Too high the chance of discovery. Other families have used it, but then nobody in this region has a hunter like father amongst them. He is the reason we're so strong, and why we go hungry on so few nights. Without him, we are a lesser pack. Without his presence standing guard, others may see a chance to take our home. Not everybody has firm walls around them. Cooking equipment, cushioned furniture. The wind blisters my skin. I pull the furs up closer to my eyes, bend my head and push forward, one step after another. I cross the pack road in a crouch. There are no other families about, not in this weather. But Father has raised me well. I do not take unnecessary risks. I laugh at the thought. This whole expedition is a risk of the highest order. Still... Training is for life. I duck and run, slide into a hollow on the other side of the road, unsheath my knife and strain my ears against the wind. No sound comes, no sign to show that my progress has been spied. We families do not attack each other generally, but anybody abroad in this weather might be hungry enough. I stay this way for long minutes, senses searching the surrounding wastes. It is a fine balance. Stay still too long and I will freeze and be lost to the family. Move with undue haste and I might be caught by a stalker, killed, and still be lost. Once I am sure I am alone, I straighten, sheath my knife, and expend precious energy upon a few jumps to circulate my slowing blood. Then I am off, running as best as I can through the morning drifts towards where I hope the Aeldic Road is still recognisable. It verges on dark when I reach the caravan. It rushes out of the gloom, not on the Aeldic Road, as Morell had said, but closer on the lane between the abandoned trading outposts of the older tribes from across the straits. I crest the rise that separates the lane from the surrounding meadows and stare down at the ruined caravan with a frown, nestling my back against the partial shelter of a fallen tree. Something is wrong. I scan the remains of the battle. The lane runs between two rises that afford some shelter from the elements. Even so, snow covers the area in a thin layer, obscuring much I would like to see before I venture down to pick at the corpses. The caravan has overturned, its wheel smashed against a marker stone that has been half pulled from the ground by the impact. This was not the camp Morel had mentioned. Someone attempted to escape, and it resulted in their ruination. At least one body lies amidst the wreckage. Snowbound lumps litter the laneway. I tentatively identify half a dozen as human, and mark out another dozen or so as worthy of examination. Father was hunting, and if he is dead, I need to complete the task. That means gathering tools, anything that might be of use to the family. It also means making sure no survivors crawled away to bring the world down upon our heads. If no food is to be found in skins or bottles, I will have to carve the best meat from the bodies of the travellers. But these tasks can wait. I have realised what is wrong. I cannot see father, nor any trace of him. That means only one thing. He is still alive. Dead men leave more trails than a live man who takes care to cover his presence. I crouch against the tree long enough for the breath to sting as it leaves my nostrils, scanning for signs of father. I don't expect to find me. I can hide from even the most determined pursuer, and what I know, father taught me. I suffer a moment's depression at the thought. Then it occurs to me, this training is my best chance of locating him. I may not know everything father does, but I only have to pick up the scent of his trail, the signs that only one trained as I am could locate. My imagination will supply the rest. I shift my gaze back to the beginning of my search pattern, and despite the pain of the cold, slowly scan across the ground again. This time, I do not search for father. I look at the progress of the fight, playing it out in my mind, placing figures against the white backdrop. When my mental battle ends, I replace father's image with my own and look once more at the surrounding cover. Where would I go? Where would I hide? 
What would I do to conceal myself from discovery? There, a slight disturbance in the rise of a nearby hillock, unnoticeable to the gaze of a pursuer, but affording anyone behind it an uninterrupted view of the landscape below. Once I have it in my sights, I discern other signs of father's progress, tiny depressions that speak of paused footsteps, a hollow where a body may have rested, or fallen, a branch that bears more snow than those around it. I visualise my progress up that slope. In doing so, I know where father lies. One question remains. Does he lie so still by choice? I will not find out from my present position. There is no way to delay what must come. I wince as frozen muscles propel me to a standing position and take care to stretch as I leave my cover and stride down into the centre of the clearing, exposing myself to his view. I turn towards his hiding place and raise my face. Father, I say, my voice clear and empty of fear. I am here. No response. I didn't expect one. He occupies the high ground. He won't come down to me, even in voice. I walk up the rise, my hands visible at all times, making no attempt to hide the signs of my approach. I crest the rise. A shallow depression lies between hillocks, a hollow scoured out of the ground by wind and rain, deep enough for an overhang of vegetation to conceal the figure propped up by the edge of the hole. A casual observer would take him for dead. Father, I kneel before him, tilt my head to show my open throat. He gives no indication that he's other than the corpse he resembles. I keep my position, eyes lowered. Slowly, an inch at a time, he raises his hand and runs a finger along the line of my throat, from ear to shoulder blade, then lets his hand drop. I exhale and sink backwards into a sitting position. How bad is it? My eyes race across him, looking for injury. He opens his arms and lets his jacket fall open. A rash of red stains the side of his shirt. Not my worst, he says. I hear the pain he tries to hide. I lean forward and peel the shirt away from his skin, exposing the bullet wound to view. He doesn't flinch or inhale too sharply. He has washed the wound with snow. I do it again, and then he does wince and hiss between his teeth. The ball is still in there. Not too far. I sit back on my haunches. Can you walk? Well enough. Then why? I gesture at his hideaway and the world outside. It was worse when it happened. He matches my gaze, Hunter's eyes steady. Why did you come? Mother was worried. You've been gone too long. He waits for a long time before replying. He knows I lie. We both recognise it. Finally he nods, and his grip changes upon his knife. Help me up. Yes, father. I lean forward, using the movement to disguise my hand as I draw my knife from its sheath. Even so, he is ahead of me. His thrust causes me to drop my shoulder sideways and barge into him. His knife whistles past my ribs. Father grunts and falls back against the cave wall. I follow him, slamming my body into his. He groans and pushes me away, heaving himself off the rough surface. We fall out of the hollow in an untidy bundle. He reaches for my shoulder blade with his free hand, fingers tuck underneath it and pull. I scream and thrust my head forward against the bridge of his nose. It crushes under the blow. He reels back, a small respite giving us both time to find our feet and crouch into a fighting stance, balanced upon the balls of our feet. Bodies turn to present the smallest possible target for the other's blade. Neither of us speaks. Neither offers explanation or question. We both know the why of it and what awaits us. We circle the tiny depression, backing up the slight rise of each hillock in an attempt to find an angle of attack. For the first time I look at father not as a hunter or imposing head of the family, but as opponent. He's smaller than I and holds his injured side as far away as possible, favouring his offhand, his less used grip. But he is still faster of movement, hard, unforgiving like a biting snake. The father always kills without thought or mercy. I am no longer his son. He will not hesitate. He lunges, and I swivel away from the strike, 
bringing my unarmed fist down towards his wrist. I miss, and he twists his finger across the knife's hilt, slicing sideways in a movement I could not replicate without hours of practice. The blade misses my flesh, but his fingers, hard as wood, crack against my forearm, deadening my grip. I leap backwards and risk shaking my arm to drive the blood back along it. Father smiles, a sharp, humorless sign of satisfaction. He presses forward, his blade nipping at my desperate reposts. I back up the incline, feet sliding on the snow. He follows slowly, not rushing, using the speed of his arm to keep me on the defensive. I reach the top of the hillock. My foot slips over the sudden decline of the far side and I slide to one knee. Father steps forward to strike. I continue my movement, letting my chest thud against the ground, splaying my arms out as I hit. My right arm sweeps around and I feel the drag as my knife bites the flesh of Father's calf. He yowls and falls backwards, sliding down the hillock on his back. I dive after him, letting the full weight of my body strike him before he has a chance to find his feet. Something cracks. He flings me off in a burst of strength. I land on my hands and feet and swing round to face him, limbs tense for another rush. Father kneels before me, head hung low as he gasps in great lungfuls of air. The wound at his side has opened further during his fall. Blood seeps below the hem of his shirt. His knife arm hangs at an awkward angle and his hand is empty. I wait, but he doesn't move. I see the handle of my knife under his left leg. He can't draw it out. His shoulder is broken, and any movement to recover the blade will drag the broken ends of bone across each other. I draw myself to my feet and circle him at a safe distance, just outside of body's length. He makes no move to track my progress. I crouch behind him and place my forehead against his back. Father. He raises his working hand to his shoulder. I raise my own and we lock fingers. He squeezes. And the pressure of his fingers passes on his love and pride and his plea to look after the family. We hold the contact for a dozen breaths before his grip loosens and his hand falls back to his lap. I break his neck, swift and clean and close my eyes as he slumps to the ground. I kneel in the snow until cramps in my legs cause me to cry out as I stand. When I can ignore the task no longer, I turn father's body over so he lies on his back, open eyes gazing at a point somewhere beyond my toes. I retrieve my knife from its resting place between his legs. Beginning at his head, I run fingers over father's body, removing his clothes and folding them into the satchel I find tucked into the back of his hollow. His knife sheath lies empty against his thigh. I untie it and sling it over my shoulder while I work. A small bracelet of hair and stone circles his wrist. I cut it free and place it amongst the clothes, then quickly move across his skin, checking for any other implements that may benefit the family. I find nothing. His knife lies a few paces away. I pick it up. It is longer and heavier than mine, the most obvious mark of his position as head of the family. I heft it a moment, testing its balance against my grip. Then looking down at his sightless eyes, I tie a sheath around my other thigh and slide the knife inside. After assuring myself that nothing else lies inside the hollow, I hang the satchel over my shoulder and drag father's corpse over the rise and down to the ruined wagon at its base. I sit him against the wagon so that his dead eyes watch me as I circle the battle scene building a pile of resources in the middle of the space. Utensils, clothing, skins of food and wine in quantities too big for a single man to carry. The lumps under the snow resolve themselves into men, faces and throats slashed by a single knife, arms caked in frozen blood where they were thrown up in a futile act of protection. Several firearms appear beneath my searching fingers. I examine each in turn then replace them. Knives are silent and only need sharpening. Once I have completed looting, I turn my attention to the wagon, lying like a broken beast at the outer limit of the clearing. It sits on its side, the far wheel buckled and broken where a place marker has shattered the rim and caused it to topple against the old rocks that litter the edge of the rise. Personal effects lie scattered beyond, boxes thrown clear to smash open upon impact. Picking out a hand mirror and some hair combs and a straight razor, the rest I return to their boxes, dusting them with handfuls of snow until only the most dedicated search would reveal any interference. 
By the time the Aldwick authorities realise the wagon is not going to arrive, it will be the middle of the snow, and wolves will play havoc with the wreckage before searchers ride out in the thaw. Even so, that is the future, and it does not do to discard habits of care and caution. I make the site safe, then move on to the wagon itself. I find the woman at the back of the wreck, under a tangle of boxes and farming implements. She lies face up, arms outflung as if some great blow has struck her chest, hurling her upon the ground like a dead calf. Her throat is a ruined hole, and I don't need to see the teeth marks to know who tore it out, or how. Frozen blood coats her fingernails. The fresh scars I spied upon father's back as I undressed him were proof enough. This woman is more than just another corpse to be stripped and ransacked. I finish wiping the snow from her face. Even through the blood and the carnage of father's feeding, I recognise her. I've seen these eyes before, the bridge of this nose, these cheekbones, now bitten by frost and slashed by an errant stroke of father's knife. I have seen this face alive, younger, fresher, but most definitely this face. I inhale with a sudden shock, turn my gaze away and blink my eyes back into focus. I'll tell your daughter you fought, I say, and lower her eyelids with my hand. A thin band of silver circles the base of her throat, preserved amongst the damage. I lift her head, reach round the back and unclasp it. Placing the chain on my thigh, I sever a lock of her hair with my knife and wind it and the chain together until they form a wristlet, twisted tightly together and held in place with a quick knot. Later, once I've reached safety, I will melt a small measure of wax over the knot to seal it. For now, I slip it around the handle of my knife and sheath it, pinning the memento between leather and flesh. I'll make sure she knows, I say, and take care to cover her body with reverence. I return to the centre of the clearing and the pile of materials I've salvaged. I'm large and strong, and on a day of perfect weather I can carry almost double my body weight into the loping run we use when hunting. But I'm tired and injured. No amount of wishing will let me bear the plunder I've accumulated. I work quickly, separating those things which will benefit the family from those that will merely prolong my comfort. I discard everything not useful to more than one member of the family. In the end, I take a skein of wine to sustain my journey homeward and load myself with clothing, utensils and two snares of solid metal from the back of the wagon. Several empty jars constitute a rare prize and I spend several minutes considering ways to carry them. Preserving what vegetables we grow will help immeasurably next snow. I choose a dozen and thread the fastening of father's jerkins through their clasp, hanging them from my shoulder like a tinker's wear. The rest of the salvage I returned to their original spots, as best I remember, save a haunch of dried meat and several packets of seeds which will be a blessing come the thaw. For long moments I contemplate taking my knife to one of the corpses. Fresh meat is unheard of at this time of year, and my knife marks would soon be covered by the teeth of hungry wolves. In the end I decide against it. I have neither the strength nor room to carry our worthwhile burden of meat, and should I fall and die, and be discovered in the thaw, what I have will mark me as a solitary looter, dissuading any rescue party from searching further afield. If I stop to satiate my hunger now, I may never find enough strength in my legs to leave. A tightening belly is the greatest spur. As many ways as there are to protect the family, there are an equal number of ways to betray them. Father would make no mistake, and now neither can I. Thought of the dead traveller's flesh reminds me of another need. I return to the wagon, and praying my apologies to the dead woman's spirit, slice several thin strips from Morel's mother's inner thigh. Her petticoats hide my cuts. Scavengers will do the rest. The meat is moist and tender, and I slip it inside the cuff of my jacket, except for the strip I place under my tongue. I will draw upon the dead woman's wisdom as I travel, suck her courage and love from the meat. When I return to Morel, we will already be family. I have only one thing left to do, and then my journey homeward can begin. I reach into the wagon and pull out a long, oiled skin, opening it to reveal the rifle that lies inside. Father showed me, once, how to work such a weapon, 
when I had hunted with him on enough occasions to prove I was worthy of further teaching. Anything can be a weapon, he told me, and all weapons must be understood. I load the ball and powder from the packets within the skin, tamp them down, and heft the weight of the rifle as I turn to face father's corpse. The searchers in the thaw must see an enemy, a cause for the carnage around them, and the trail needs to end here, with that enemy defeated and dead. I aim down the barrel at the spot just above his right eye. I want to say something, to make some sort of apology, but that is not our way. What we do is always for survival. I press the trigger. The flint catches. A single boom echoes across the open space. Father's head snaps back and forward, and the ruined eye socket that stares at me bears nothing of his likeness. I turn away, repack the rifle, and begin to clean the sight of my presence. When I am finished, I climb the rise over which I first arrived and view my work nodding in satisfaction. The sight lies as I discovered it, and the snow will soon muddy even the few tiny marks I made in leaving. The journey home will be hard and dangerous, but I can undertake it in the knowledge that the hunt was successful, and the family will remain safe for pursuit. And I am alive. I shoulder my burden, lean into the wind, and begin the journey home. It takes two days to reach the house, Two days of trudging through thickening snowbanks, slipping across puddles of ice, and tucking my face further and further down into my coat to deflect the shards of pain that shatter against my skin with every gust of wind. By the time the house shimmers through the storm, and I slump against the doorway with just enough strength left to drop my fist against the wood in the right series of knocks, my eyes are all but sealed shut, and I no longer feel anything except the icicles in my lungs. I scarcely register the arms that drag me inside or the bodies that crowd around me in front of the kitchen fire, lending their warmth and welcome to the heat creeping into my bones. By the time I open my mouth and accept a few swallows of mulled cider, I'm too warm, and shrug children from my chest and shoulders. Soon I struggle out of my overgarments and stand alone, swaying, in my shirt sleeves, gesturing to whoever is nearest for another shot of the revitalising cider. My mug is refilled. I swallow it in one long draught, cough and spit into the fire as the dram hits my throat and spreads its magic out along my limbs. I turn away from the flames. The family is gathered around the far edge of the table, mother at their head. Kester, she says, as much warning as greeting. I give her a small, acknowledging smile. Mother. I retrieve the pile of treasure from where it was stripped from me and heft it onto the table. Youngsters are dispatched to store the haunch of meat and snares and take the seeds down to the cellar. Mother takes possession of the jars and places them high upon a shelf out of the reach of little fingers. When everyone has returned, I pull my satchel from the pile. Gather everyone here. Kester, Mother steps forward, arm half raised. Now. She stops and turns to the children. Quickly. We wait, not looking at each other, until the whole family arrives. Morel is amongst them. She is dressed in family clothes, her hair tied back in the way Mother prefers. She stands between two older boys towards the back of the group. When the entire family is assembled, I open the satchel. I remove Father's clothing and spread it out on the table so everyone can see. I hear shock and some of the children strangle back cries. Mother stands with a hand over her mouth. Her eyes are fixed upon me. She knew the moment I arrived at the doorway. Now she cannot pretend otherwise. I untie father's knife from my thigh, then step around the table and present it to her. She takes it without word, and I turn my back. Mother is quick and fierce. I barely hear the knife as it slips from the sheath. I twist just as she lunges, catching her arm under my own and continuing the movement so she strikes the table with the front of her stomach. I lift her up so she lies face down amongst father's clothes. I pin her there with one hand and rake her skirt up with the other, exposing her hindquarters to view. I step over her leg, part her thighs with mine and unbutton myself. I enter her in a sharp, violent thrust. She lies silent as I take her, letting me come in no more than a dozen short strokes. But it's enough. 
but I'm finished, I stand back, draw my trousers up and refasten them. She stays still for perhaps half a minute and slides from the table and turns to face me. We meet gazers. She bends her head and presents me the knife. I take it, recover the sheath from where it is dropped and slide in the blade. Mother drops to her knees and ties it to my thigh. I hold my hand out to her. She takes it, rises and stands at my side. Take her. I point to Morel, stiff with shock by the doorway. Take her to her room and educate her. Make sure she understands. The wristlet lies amongst the pile of treasures still to be distributed as gifts. I will give it to her when she's ready. For now there's much to be done. I must make my family safe for the snow, ensure that the infants are weaned so that their mothers will be ready to bear children when I visit them in the thaw. And Morel must be taught her role like mother was taught before her. She must understand her place in the family as mother understands hers. Mother turns to me and in front of my family kisses me. Yes, father, she says. And now, Jason Fisher reads Undead Camels Ate Their Flesh. With its usual efficiency, the sun blazed down on bugger all. It was the outback, with nothing for hundreds of miles but heat, dust and flies. Shuffling through this wasteland was a dead man, his footprints leading back to civilization. He'd grown in cunning since his murder, knew to avoid the roads during the day. When hunger struck, he gorged himself on roadkill, scanning the horizon cautiously as his leathery hands tore at flesh. A truck was braving the old highway, slowly navigating the cracked asphalt. At the first sound of engines, the man fell to the ground, playing dead. The truck drove on, spluttering and backfiring as it downshifted. No one ever stopped. Somehow the dead man knew that he was an endangered species. He had a dim memory of city streets, of walking around in a horde and smelling out the hidden fresh ones. When they caught one, it was glorious, almost communal. Things went bad when the fresh ones fought back. There was nothing left for it but to shuffle away, hoping to escape the slaughter of his kind. Something primal told him to follow this road, and this northern exodus had taken years. Somewhere in the centre of his dead brain, certain things remained hardwired. He still knew that things went wrong for a man. It was good to go north for a while. For a dead bloke, he was a survivor. I didn't mean it, Swanee said, his shaking hands still cradling the smoking sawn off. His ears rang from the blast. Bloody worthless you are, Trev said, snatching the gun out of his hands. Now we are royally stuffed. Thanks a lot. It went off by itself, the boy said quietly. He stepped away from the body, looking down in horror. We killed him. No, Swanee, you killed him, because you're a stupid twat. Now get over here and help me. They dragged the body into the office, bundling him up under the desk. We could feed him to the pigs, Swanee suggested. Leave no trace. What's the point, Trev said. Look at all that blood and shit all over the floor. We need to open the safe and get out of here. Checking through the blinds, the older man made sure no one was approaching the house. It was a big farm, and there was a chance no one had heard the gun go off. He gestured to Swanee for the satchel, which he threw across the room. We could have beaten the combination out of him, but you had to blow his head off, Trev grunted, sticking the explosives to the outside of the safe. Now every bastard is going to hear this. They set the fuse and ran. The explosion blew the thick metal door off its hinges, shattered the furniture, blew all the glass out of the windows. Swanee had packed the charge with his usual enthusiasm. Coughing, Trev waded through the wreckage of Buchanan's office. He reached into the safe, beating out the flames. Half of the contents were on fire. I can't rely on you for anything, Trev shouted. He opened up his bag, stuffing it full of notes. We're rich, Trev, Swanee said with a daft grin. He'd never seen this much money. Ah, it's all useless, Trev said, holding up a half-charred note. It was King Christian's face, not King William. 
Swanee looked confused. It's Danish money, Trev said with his last shred of patience. No one around here will take these. They took it anyway, shoveling everything into the duffel bag and running out the back door. At least Trev's battered motorcycle was still there. Two farmhands were yelling and running towards the house, but stopped at the sight of Trevor Flanagan with a shotgun. Get back, he ordered, sweeping the gun across the frightened pair. Swanee fell into the sidecar, huddling the bag of loot on his knees. Not taking his eyes off Buchanan's men, Trev trod on the starter. Nothing. Mongrel of a thing, he muttered, and pushed the starter again. This time the ancient machine gave a slight cough. Just when he'd given up hope, the motorcycle roared into life and Trev hammered the throttle, kicking up dust as he spun the machine around and shot for the gate. Swanee made sure to give the farmhands the finger, pulling a face through his motorcycle goggles. Trev raced through the farm district, stopping only when he caught sight of the barricade surrounding Port Augusta, a wall of old tyres and broken cars. They picked a good time to do over Buchanan. Most of his hired help were at the football final in town. At least that part had gone well. We can't go in there, he said over the rough chatter of the engine. People know we went to meet with Buchanan. The cops will put two and two together. Can't we just spend some money, Swanee moaned. We're rich. It's Danish money, idiot. We need to get far away, right now. Those farmhands will be riding into town. The prospect of being hung for murder made Swanee touch his throat gingerly and he gulped. They'd killed a man, accident or not. In the distance he could see a man on top of the barricade, gun at the ready. They'd been spotted. I should have shot their horses, Trev said. I'll have to go around the town. Hopefully we'll make it to Pimba. Yeah, we should head north, Swanee agreed, looking at the fortified town. North is good. Camels. A great herd of the feral beasts was coming this way. Australia turned them loose when the motor car came to conquer the interior, and they repaid this favour by breeding like mad and eating everything in sight. The dead man could smell them downwind and crouched to the ground. He hadn't eaten for days and was hungry. The only thing he'd found on the road were bones bleached white by the sun. Keeping perfectly still, he lay in the spiny grass and red dust. Years of dry heat had mummified him, yet he didn't suffer from the rot or the smell that many of his companions had. With the right wind, hours of stillness could pay off in a kill. A feral camel wandered over the rise, oblivious to the unnatural creature that lay in wait. The first the camel knew of disaster was when something reached up and sank sharp teeth into its leg. Squealing in terror, the beast bit back, wrenching the dead man loose. It hurled him away, the man tumbling down the sand dunes with a mouthful of flesh. The camel spat and hissed, a terrible taste in its mouth from where its pegged teeth had broken the dead man's skin. The herd broke into a gallop and scattered into many directions, and the bitten camel run too. It started feeling wrong, had trouble keeping up. Frustrated, it spat and bit at the nearest camel. This felt good, felt right. Eyes rolling and mouth foaming, it bit another one, tore through the skin this time. Trev's motorcycle started to splutter when Pimba was in sight. There was still plenty of fuel in the tank. Something else was going wrong in the innards of the ancient machine. They were still several miles away when the engine gave a death rattle and died. They rolled to a stop, engine ticking and boiling. I've had this bloody thing since the plague broke out, Trev said. It took me from Brisbane to Melbourne, and when the bloody Danes came, I got from Melbourne to Adelaide in one night. I even hit a zombie once and it only wobbled a bit. They sat there, Trev tight-lipped and Swanee too frightened to say anything. The older man was furious, gripping the handlebars tightly. The engine stank of burnt oil, and a cloud of flies descended on the stricken pair. This thing was worth ten of you, Trev said, pointing a finger at the terrified lad. Treated me right when nothing else did. So what happens when I need it the most? Swanee said nothing, clutched the duffel bag tighter. Trev got handy with his fists when he was angry. I'll tell you what happens. The goddamn engine dies at Pimba. The asshole of the world. He hopped off the bike and kicked the wheel hard, stubbing his toe. Launching into a string of curses, Trev snatched the shotgun out of its holder, priming a shell and pointing it at the bike. Wailing with terror, Swanee fell out of the sidecar, 
dragging the heavy duffel bag behind him. Don't shoot it, Trev, he implored. Tank's full of fuel! Glaring at the bike like a madman, Trev started to squeeze the trigger, a nervous tick causing half his face to twitch. Taking a deep breath, he pointed the weapon at the sky, when the dodgy trigger fired all by itself. We've got to get rid of the gun, Trev! Someone's going to get killed, Swanee said. Trev ignored him, grabbing his swag and the potato sack that housed Swanee's worldly possessions. They both landed at the lad's feet. Carry those, Trev said, and started walking along the cracked bitumen of the old highway. Struggling under the weight of all the bags, Swanee rushed to keep up with his mentor. What are we going to do now, Trev, he puffed. Should we stay here for a while? Nah, too close to a murder scene, Trev said. We've got to keep moving, keep heading north. We go west, we enter what's left of civilization. Cops, the army, jail, if we're lucky. Why don't we go east? We've got Danish money. Why not go to New Denmark? Stuff that. If I wanted to hang out with a bunch of boxhead krauts, wouldn't have left in the first place, would I? Trev said. We go there, we end up in a work camp with everyone else, working for King Christian, the fucking invader. Swanee hefted all the bags, wanting to stop for a rest. The road shimmered with heat haze, and the tiny town seemed to be getting further away from them. There was nothing but the endless plodding along the cracked surface, and he could feel the heat rising through his old boots. He wondered how long the duct tape holding them together would last. When they reached the tiny township, it was mostly deserted. The few grubby children watched them go past, gawking at the pair that had walked out of the bush. "'Where's a mechanic?' Trev demanded, and a boy of perhaps ten pointed up the main street. They continued playing with the half-deflated football, and it was unlikely they'd ever seen a classroom. Asshole of the world, Trev muttered. They found an old service station with an open workshop, an old petrol guzzler standing over the pit with its engine pulled to pieces. The bowsers were covered in cobwebs, and there was an old sign nailed against the shop front. No petrol, it read, and he wasn't surprised. Oi! he called out, unable to see anyone. Anyone here? Hang on, someone said, and a man clambered out of the pit, covered in grease and filth. He looked about a hundred. What do you want? Bike broke down just outside of town. I'll need you to fix it. Might have the parts, the man said, eyeing Trev's shotgun. Have you got money or something you could trade for it? Here, Trev said, reaching for the duffel bag. He unzipped it, carefully pulling out one stack of bills. No sense showing this arsehole how rich we are, Trev thought. He hadn't survived this long by being stupid. This is Danish money, the mechanic said. I won't take this. Please, we need the bike fixed, whined Swanee. We've got more money. Shut up, said Trev. Will you fix it or not? You got any Aussie money, the man said. Trev shook his head. I lost two sons, the mechanic said. The first was in Adelaide, and the zombies got him. The second was in the army reserve, and some Dane put a bullet through his head during the invasion. When two strangers roll into town with a big stack of kraut money, I get suspicious. Are you calling me a boxhead? Trev yelled, priming the gun. What are you trying to say? The mechanic looked at him calmly, wiping his hands with an oily rag. Did I tell you about my other two sons, he said and two stocky young men stepped out of the shadows of the workshop. One held a large revolver. The other had a Rottweiler slavering at the end of a chain, a cricket bat in his free hand. The pair of you can just piss off, the mechanic said calmly, picking up a tire iron. I don't help traders or Danes. Trev was angry but not stupid. He would only drop one of them before the other two jumped him. He backed out of the workshop, gun levelled at the two sons. Big mistake, he called out. You'll regret this. The pair of them ran from the petrol station and ran through the dusty side streets till they found an abandoned shack to hole up in. Trev didn't know if there was a copper in Pimba and he didn't want to take his chances. After several minutes without the sound of pursuit, they peered through the broken windows, sweaty and covered in dust. What are we going to do now? Swanee said. I'm hungry. I don't know, idiot. How about you go to the nearest shop and buy us some lunch, Trev said. Take as much money as you need. Trev thought furiously, and Swanee tried to think. 
What passed for his look of concentration made him look constipated, and Trev only tolerated the boy because he made him feel smart. I'd abandon him in a second, if it was him or me, he thought. The police force still has a working fleet of cars, and they're bound to search Pimper soon. We've got to leave now. Should we steal a horse? Swanee offered, to be rewarded with a slap across the back of his head. The only car in this shit old town is in pieces, back in that tosser's workshop. We either need to steal food and wait till the heat dies down, or somehow get the bike working again. There was a long hooting sound that cut through the air, making the broken shards of glass shake in the frame. Trev leapt to his feet, a grin from ear to ear. Train, he said. Snatching up his swag, he dragged Swanee to his feet. They sprinted across the small town until they hit a train line, and the train barreled past them, headed towards the local siding. It's the Garn, Swanee said. We can go right up to Darwin if we want to. The train doesn't go to Darwin. It's still a zombie town, Trev said, puffing and panting as they ran alongside the train. When it slowed down to stop, he hoisted himself into a baggage compartment. Grudgingly, he offered Swanee a hand. We're getting off at Alice Springs. There's sometimes work to be had there. Maybe we can change some of this money over somewhere. What are we going to do in Alice Springs? I'm not good at nothing, Swanee said. The depression that had swept the country after the plague had killed most homeless kids. And if it wasn't for Trevor, he would have starved by now. Use your imagination, mate. We could join some shooters. I hear they're that desperate for meat up there that they'll eat camel. Shifting the gun belt that held up his fat gut, Chief Inspector Wallace knelt down, careful not to get the bloody mess on his trousers. He didn't get out in the field much these days, and it showed. Not zombies for once, he said, picking up the shotgun shell. Stupid bastards choose to live outside the wall. You see what happens, the young constable started. Wallace glared at him like he was a dog turd hiding in a box of donuts, and the man wisely shut up. Buchanan was my brother-in-law, he said. My old lady is beside herself, you little shit. Do me a favour and interrogate the farmhands or the pigs or something. I don't care what, just get out. For what it was worth, the fingerprint guy had been all over the place. He'd found nothing, but since the computers had stopped, the police had bugger all to work with anyway. They had to rely on old methods and equipment, but contingency plans meant nothing when all the records were gone. Where did they shoot you, mate? Wallace wondered. There was a square of paper soaking up blood, and he peeled it off the floor with a pair of tweezers. Danish money? He mumbled to himself. What the hell was he into? Boss, one of the town shooters just got on the radio, the young copper said, timidly poking his head around the doorway. Says they saw a motorbike circling the town this morning. Two fellas. Weird that they didn't come in and fuel up. Where'd they go, Wallace said, shifting his bulk as they got to his feet. There were only a handful of working cars in the district, and no bikes. North, towards Pimba, he said, ducking out of the way as the chief inspector barreled through the door. Wallace moved quick for a fat man, and he was angry. Hardly anything got him out from behind the desk these days. I pity those blokes when he catches them, the constable said to the fingerprint guy. They'll be praying for zombies. Thousands of feral camels died within hours of the first bite. This news should have made most outback farmers happy, but people still remembered the plague. Varied reports went out over the Apache Ham radio network, speaking of aggressive camel packs attacking livestock and people, and eating them. Zombie camels? One ham operator in Alice Springs snorted. His ranger friend was noted for telling tall tales. A hundred miles away, his friend was dead, dragged from his shattered four-wheel drive by a camel missing half its face. The entire pack devoured his broken body, jostling with each other for a feed. With blood-spattered jowls and marble-white eyes, a vast, stinking horde of dromedaries made for Alice Springs, drawn by the bright lights on the horizon and the distant smell of fresh meat. Their great honking howls echoed throughout the night. I saw them, officer, the mechanic said. They come in here perhaps three days ago toting a big bag full of kraut money and a shotgun. The lads and I chased them away, but we lost them after that. Great, Wallace said, looking around the filthy workshop. The only car in town lay in pieces before him. You got a pair of killers gone to ground somewhere in your town. Why don't you get on the radio? You idiots have put everyone in danger. 
When's the last time we saw the law in this town? No one cared about this place, not even before the plague. We look after ourselves here. Doing a good job, Waller said, turning his bulk on the man as he returned to his squad car, which bristled with antennas and rust. He would poke through every abandoned shack and lean to in this dust bowl until he found Stephen's killers. The chief inspector was armed to the teeth and vengeful. It was not likely they would be brought to trial or even buried. Law had changed around here. After a fruitless morning of poking through a town that was post-apocalyptic before the plague, Wallace saw the train line shimmering on the horizon. He visited the sidings on the edge of town and saw the yellow timetable from the nail that held it up. At least the trains still run proper, he pondered, wondering if he had enough fuel to take him to Alice Springs. We don't need shooters, the foreman told Trev. It's stupid to shoot him out in the bush. Unless you plan on cooking and eating your camel on the spot, Smart ways to round them up. Bring them into town and take them to the slaughterhouse. I don't have a horse or a bike, but I've got a gun, Trev said. The outriders laughed. Well, mate, perhaps some farmer needs help with the rabbit problem. I doubt you'll hit anything with that old thing, though. I could hit you, Trev thought, but bit his tongue. They were in hiding and desperate for cash. Last thing they needed was trouble with the law, though he ached to lay into the cocky prick. Swanee had started work yesterday for a local preserver. The days of fridges and canning had gone by the wayside, and he worked on an assembly line, pushing wax seals into glass jars full of fruit and meat. It's women's work, Trev had laughed at the time. But Swanwick was the only one with a job. Trev had pounded the pavements till he wanted to pound some heads. No luck. They discreetly tried to change some of the Danish notes with limited success. Alice Springs had been left alone during the invasion, but many sons and husbands had gone off to fight throughout the district. The hostel had accepted one note with great reluctance, providing a week's accommodation. They would not do this again. A fortune and nowhere to spend her, Trev moaned, not for the first time that day. He flopped onto the uncomfortable bed, waiting for Swanee to come home so he could hit him for beer money. Literally. Making sure that the door was closed, Trev went through the bag one more time in the vain hope that some Australian currency had been in Buchanan's safe. It was nothing but the Danish money and some boring-looking papers. With nothing better to do, Trev actually took the time to read them, took a closer look at the maps that they'd snatched from the safe. What the hell was Buchanan doing? Trev thought, his head spinning. What he held in his hands amounted to high treason, spoke of sabotage and troop movements. Perhaps I'll get some sort of reward for turning this in. We killed a Danish spy. He'd only known that Buchanan was a wealthy landowner near Port Augusta. Went there with the pretense of looking for work. We bungled the heist, but I reckon we've come up with something better than loot, he exulted. This'll clear my name. He was still sitting there on the bed, surrounded by enemy money and plans for sabotage and invasion, when the door opened. It was another person he'd seen in the hostel, another labourer down on his luck. Oh, sorry, mate. Wrong room, the bloke said, doing a double take when he took in the scene. The white and red kroner of New Denmark was distinctive, and to be seen with so much of it could only mean one thing. Oh, Christ, the man said, slamming the door a moment before Trev blasted away with the ever-present shotgun. There were screams of pain, the sounds of running and doors slamming. Fuck, fuck, fuck it all, Trev said, pushing the bed up against the door and jamming more shells into the breech of the gun. I'm not a spy, he shouted through the broken door, letting off another round just to show he meant business. I'm a fucking thief. Wallace had navigated hundreds of miles of cracked highway, and when the barren landscape gave way to the green outskirts of Alice Springs, he breathed a sigh of relief. He was literally driving on the fumes in his tank, the boot full of empty jerry cans. The old car had begun to overheat, and he doubted it would make the return journey. No wonder this place was spared by the plague, he thought. No zombie would ever make it across that wasteland. He noticed the smoke from several fires rising above the town, wondered why he couldn't hear the bells of the fire brigade. There was screaming in the distance, and as he prowled through the streets in the cruiser, Wallace saw people darting into doorways, as if the devil was on their heels. The engine began to struggle as the tank ran out, and the car stalled in the middle of the road, engine ticking. Where the hell is the petrol station? A young lad ran around the corner and didn't see the police car, running into the driver's side door. 
The chief inspector launched a beefy arm out of the window and grabbed him by the collar before he could flee. What's going on? Wallace demanded. The camels are coming, the boy cried. They're eating everyone. Mister, you've got to get out of here. Camels? Give me that, Swanee said, pushing the young girl to the ground and taking her bike. His knees knocking against the handlebars, he poured as much energy as he could into making that pink-tasseled wonder machine go. Something from the depths of hell was hot on his tail. Several somethings that had devoured all of the little old ladies at the preservery. He heard the horrible honking cries behind him, heard the sick crunching sounds as the beasts caught the screaming little girl and tore her apart, eating her alive. What the hell? What the hell? he screamed, losing his bladder control and not caring. A great rotting head loomed out of an alleyway, square teeth nipping at him as he sped past. He felt the hot stinking breath of the camel on the back of his neck, whimpering as the teeth barely missed him. The great empty clacking sound of the teeth striking each other made him moan with fear. Camels do not eat people, Swanee sobbed. He had to find Trev. Trev would know what to do. He took the side streets when he could, hoping he would be able to find the hostel. They'd only been in Alice for two days. The wrong turn could mean becoming a camel snack. I've got to get Trev and the money and get the hell out of here. Their problems with the law seem so less important right now. There was a shotgun blast, and then another. Trev, he thought, steering towards the noise. He's alive! There was another shotgun blast, and Swanee rode into view of the hostel, abandoning the bike in the street. Within seconds, someone else nicked it to flee from the undead camels, but Swanee didn't care. He'd found salvation. Take that, you bastards, Trev yelled from somewhere inside. I've got plenty more where that came from. One of the camels had tried to walk into the front door of the hostel and got stuck. It roared with impatience and Swanee could hear it bashing at the internal walls with its great heavy head. He wouldn't be going in that way. Creeping down the back alleyway, Swanee froze as something knocked over a bin. It was a cat screeching in terror. It tried to bolt for safety but as it ran across the street, one of the abnormally swift camels struck like a snake and swallowed it whole. Then it looked up, pale dead eyes regarding Kevin Swanwick. He felt his bowels release and ran up the alleyway, undeath, hot at his heels. Sweet Jesus, he said, leaping through the window. Broken glass and shit covered him, and Swanee lay in a painful pile on the floor. The room stank of cordite, and Trev was loading more shells into the shotgun. Where the hell have you been? Trev demanded. Hang on, did you piss and shit yourself? The camels, Swanee managed, a split second before the zombie camel rammed its dead head through the window, blood-stained teeth snapping at Swanee. Trev emptied the shotgun into its head, round after round until he was leaning outside the window to finish the job. Finally, the horrible beast was silent and presumably still. What in the bright blue fuck was that? Trev said incredulously. Never seen a camel do that before. I'm um, Trev. Yeah, what? What the hell were you shooting at before? They moved the bed and opened the doorway. Numerous trappers and shooters had been running down the corridor to deal with a stuck camel. Trev had murdered every last one of them. I thought they were coming for me, he explained weakly. What else was I supposed to do? We need to go, Trev. We need to go now, Swanee pleaded. He reached for the duffel bag, swept the bundles of paper and money into it. Leave the money, Trev said. That shit has done nothing but curse us. I say we burn it. But Swanee held on to it. Dispatching the stuck camel with several well-placed rounds, Trev and Swanee stepped over its twitching body and stepped into the absolute anarchy that was post-camel Alice Springs. Somewhere in the distance, with a sound of screams, it seemed that the movement of the undead herd had passed this spot. Not looking for a shooter, eh? Trev said as he walked past the dismembered corpse of the foreman. Smart ways to round them up and bring them into town, he mimicked, poking the dead man's head with his boot. Not too flaming smart, are you? Trev, Swanee whispered, we need to get a car or something. Stop messing about. Momentarily stunned by Swanee's rare display of backbone, Trev complied. They both had guns now, though Swanee didn't realise the rifle from the hostel wasn't loaded. It made him feel better at any rate. There was a noise behind them, and the pair of petty thugs turned, only to see a morbidly obese police officer. Trev swore. 
Behind you, the man said calmly, raising his pistol. The pair turned, fired at the camel that lurched drunkenly towards them. Swanee panicked and threw his useless rifle at the undead beast, which the stranger dropped with a well-placed shot to the eyes. You there, the cop said. Forgot to do your bag up. Swanee looked down and saw the coroner sticking out of the open duffel bag. The man had a pistol levelled at Trev and gestured for Swanee to drop the bag. Over my dead body, Trev said, lifting the shotgun. He was so focused on the fat man that he didn't hear the camel until it pounced on him, all pegged teeth and grinding punishment. Swanee squeaked with dismay and was frozen with fear. Several camels were running towards them, honking and slavering, broad feet kicking up the dust as they charged. The policeman grabbed him by the collar, jerked him into a different direction. Swanee was too terrified to object. I've got a score to settle with you, the fat man said, but you and I have got bigger problems. I know you can shoot. You shot my brother-in-law. He handed Swanee a revolver, which the young man took with disbelief. We need to get fuel and we need to leave. Help me, and I promise not to leave you for the camels. It was a no-brainer, even for Swanee. They almost made it, too. At long last, the dead man staggered into Alice Springs. How long he'd travelled was beyond his limited understanding, but he'd finally made it as far north as he'd ever been in his previous life. It was glorious, a dream come true, and he took in the vista with a moaning, wordless amazement. Hordes of the undead staggered around in the streets, half-eaten and moving. Even more of a surprise, the great spitting beasts of the desert were there. In a few instances, the camels were quite happy to let the more damaged undead ride around on them. Shuffling forward, the zombie was greeted with moans of recognition and acceptance from the newly raised dead. Let the fresh ones fight over the other places. The dead would always have this town. Undead camels ate my flesh, do-da, do-da. Undead camels ate my flesh, oh, do-da day. Ate my flesh all day, ate my flesh all night. Undead camels ate my flesh, oh, do-da day. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of the publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it.